Okay, so uh, welcome uh, to those who are uh, gathering here with us virtually uh, in the second of our uh, colloquia presentations for this semester on uh, artificial intelligence and the law. Um, uh, this is the second year that we have had this series and it's uh, uh, been exciting uh, to uh, uh, talk with the leading thinkers in uh, the area on uh, their research uh, regarding uh, regulation and, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So we are uh, really excited today to have with us uh, Professor Frank Pascal from the Brooklyn Law School, uh, who has uh, become one of the leading um, uh, and most outspoken and provocative uh, voices uh, with regard to uh, artificial intelligence and the law. Um, he is going to present to us uh, today uh, his work on data-driven duties in AI development. Um, uh, we're going to hear from him uh, for about 25 to 30 minutes, uh, summarizing uh, the work that he's published uh, on that topic. Uh, and then we will open things up for questions. Uh, you should see that there is a uh, Q&A channel uh, that you can pose questions uh, for him. And, um, uh, and so we'll, we'll look forward to that conversation. Um, uh, those of you who uh, may be here for MCLE credit, uh, there will be a, a link in, in the chat uh, towards the end of the presentation that you can use uh, to download and fill out the forms uh, for MCLE. Um, and uh, so with that, I want to turn the time over uh, to our speaker and uh, uh, hear uh, his work on uh, data-driven duties. Thanks so much, Dan. It is a real pleasure to get a chance to um, speak with uh, such an interesting group of scholars uh, and students. And um, I'll just dive right in. Um, so with the data, this data-driven duties and AI development paper, um, I, I think that one way to sort of motivate the concern uh, comes out of my uh, book that I just published last year called New Laws of Robotics. And in the chapter on medicine, one of the things that I really emphasize there is that you know, there are two AI dreams in medicine, one being that we're going to have robot doctors and, and robot nurses and, and providers all over, and they, that will sort of be this very futuristic vision and like the Star Trek tricorder to, to diagnose us. Um, and I, I will leave that to other works. Uh, but, but my focus in the book was really on uh, complementary AI, and particularly the ways in which artificial intelligence and machine learning could assist in error avoidance. Because I think that's a real uh, opportunity. We already are seeing some fantastic results. And unfortunately, in the media, they're often reported as, you know, AI is better than dermatologist or better than radiologist at identifying something. Um, that usually is on an extremely narrow test. And so, you know, you wouldn't want to sort of substitute one of these things in, in for your uh, radiologist anytime soon or, or any other form of pattern recognizing doctor. But what they can do is they can really help us to avoid errors. So for example, if a dermatologist thinks that something you know, probably is not a melanoma, but you, know, you might have an expert uh, machine learning program that has been trained on millions of images that can see something there that you know, the person cannot, um, that's a real opportunity um, for uh, machine learning to uh, supplement and to assist in making uh, our healthcare system better. Uh, so I think we could save you know, thousands of lives by really promoting this. But there are some issues that arise as we try to promote um, error reduction, error avoidance in uh, medicine. And um, this is something uh, uh, hypothetical I was first to turn to uh, via the um, book, A Deep Medicine by Eric Topol, um, really interesting thinker. I highly recommend his Twitter feed on sort of the future of, of AI and medicine, although now it's all COVID as in, as in the case of so much of us in the health law and policy space and, and elsewhere. Um, but in terms of you know, some of the hypotheticals here, we might worry that um, there are uh, databases that don't have say enough representation from minorities. You know, and we've already heard a lot of concern in the literature, and I'm gonna get into this in a, a few more slides, about lack of representativeness of databases so that you may have um, traditionally more privileged groups in society having more representation in a database uh, than others, and that leading to concern that it won't be as good. And certainly one of the best book length, you know, popular treatments of this problem recently uh, was Caroline Criado Perez's uh, book, Invisible Women which has 
a, a fantastic uh, set of case studies, or I mean, it's deeply concerning, but I think that the, the way in which she brings the science to the public is, is fantastic in the sense that she really shows how there are so many parts of medicine where the uh, studies uh, and practice were focused on men and thereby fail to identify uh, the uh, issues, concerns, uh, signs, symptoms that would be more common among women with exactly the same uh, type of presentation, um, uh, condition, et cetera. And moreover, uh, also with respect to uh, racial and ethnic minorities, um, there's a, a great piece by uh, Adamson and Smith called Machine Learning and Healthcare Disparities in Dermatology, where they worry that essentially you might have um, uh, a, a database that um, uh, is not added to um, uh, either the dermato dermatologist, radiologist, whatever the pattern recognizing doctor may be, that would essentially help supplement their current database in order to better reflect those groups who are not represented in it. And so that I think is sort of a, a big concern here, right? That we might be very worried that um, we can improve um, what we're doing by adding in AI to help pattern recognizing doctors make better diagnoses. But what happens if that those data sets are not representative and we're not improving as fast as we can with respect to underrepresented populations? Um, this is an ongoing problem because as I noted in the, the book, The Black Box Society from about five years ago, um, we don't know a lot about what is happening when these systems are deployed. So for example, Rebecca Robbins in Stat News last year um, reported that some of these AI models are fraught with bias um, uh, throughout the healthcare system. And even those that have been demonstrated to be accurate largely haven't been shown to improve patient outcomes. We worry about that a bit. Uh, we worry about that first. So we wanna want to improve patient outcomes. Um, and moreover, we don't really know the scope of the problem sometimes because the hospitals don't share data on how well the systems work. So I think that that sort of as a first step is that we wanna be able to understand the scope of the problem, right? We wanna be able to understand what exactly is going on and how can we improve things generally and not just for those who are well represented in the database. Um, here, I think there's a very interesting tension between the tort and the health disparities literature um, in, uh, with respect to the duties of both providers and of the institutions in which they practice, but primarily hospitals for our purposes. Um, in the aggregate, for example, imagine we have a dermatology department that is improving by adopting new technologies of pattern recognitions for skin abnormalities such as melanomas. Also assume hypothetically that for the majority group in this society, um, the improvement is 10%, but for minorities, the improvement is only say 1%. Okay, so we're all improving, but what one group is improving much more slowly. And this may meet or exceed a non-AI enhanced standard of care. And there's lots of great work out there about you know, AI and standards of care and medical malpractice. I mean, one of the more recent works was by Pinot, uh, Frumkin and Kerr on, on malpractice and, and uh, the standard of care and how that might be affected by AI. Um, and and you know, this may meet or exceed that non-AI enhanced standard of care, but the reduction of health disparities is both an urgent ethical norm and a well-recognized legal commitment, um, you know, as expertly um, uh, uh, diagnosed and expressed in uh, Dana Bowen Matthews' work, uh, Just Medicine, you know, a, a great book sort of describing our duties to address health disparities. And I think in terms of sort of a data disparity strategy, it's helpful to think both about um, the ACA um, and uh, the COVID context of data collection um, in the US and internationally. So with respect to section 4302 of the Affordable Care Act, that requires the population surveys and federally funded health and healthcare programs enhance their collection and reporting of data on race, ethnicity, sex, primary language, disability status, um, those living in rural and frontier areas, um, and, and other characteristics identified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. You know, they're as summarized by the National Council on State Legislatures. And this was recently, this data imperative was recently re-emphasized by the Congressional Black Caucus in the COVID context. So we have a longstanding policy of wanting to understand health disparities and do something about them. We also, on an international level, there's very interesting uh, work done by, for example, Carlos Bustamante, who estimated that in 2011, over 96% of the participants in these GWASs, genome-wide association studies, were of European descent. 
And you know, this is something that I think has been commented on by people using, say, 23andMe. Sometimes those of European descent, the the you'll get a prediction of your ancestry from like a very small part of Ireland or uh, Germany, and then some of those who are now using the um, South Asian, those of South Asian descent who use them, have just sort of a, a big circle over um, uh, India or something like that. You know, just it's just much broader, and and you know, there's the lack of there's this lack of precision, and I think that that sort of dramatizes in a more uh, uh, in a directly relatable sense, this larger problem that Bustamante has observed with respect to some of these databases. So I think that this is an ongoing problem. And I think the problem that I, the, and the problem that I set for myself with respect to this Columbia piece was, does the tort system have a place in helping remedy this? Or is it just something that, you know, we've got to try to remedy via better reimbursement policies, better re investments in uh, research and, uh, and R&D, et cetera. You know, because once you bring in the tort system, you worry that you, know, you don't want to uh, create a situation where you're discouraging people from advancing at all if they fear that they're advancing, um, if they're, uh, if they're, even though they're advancing, they're not helping everyone when they advance, right? So some of the issues that I think, you know, one, some ways to frame this that I think are helpful and that show, help root it in, a longer dialogue within health law, malpractice law, enterprise liability concerns, um, are to think about a duty of technological competence tempered by resource constraints. So for example, in the uh, famous case of Washington versus Washington Hospital Center from 1990, this was a case that involved um, a woman uh, went in for a relatively routine surgery um, that, that was Washington. Um, she had a, uh, she was being, uh, uh, intubated for just standard um, anesthesia, um, but the anesthesia tube was put down her esophagus as opposed to her windpipe. Um, and then after about 10 minutes into the surgery, um, they noted various physiological factors that indicated distress. Um, and she had been denied, basically she'd been denied oxygen or she was not breathing for um, 10 minutes and was left in a comatose state for 20 years. And the question then became, you know, should the hospital have had a carbon dioxide monitor that could have very rapidly told them that something was wrong, right? Um, and, and this is a situation where uh, essentially the hospital had to, at the time, you know, in the late 1980s or mid, mid to late 1980s, uh, this was by no means a universal accoutrement of these types of operations, right? This was by no means something that like, you would just assume would be in a hospital. It was, it was creeping towards, um, uh, there was, they were creeping towards recognition that this was really helpful technology uh, in these contexts. And what the hospital said was, look, you know, under a national standard of care, certainly this is not the standard of care. This was something that was being implemented over time. Um, however, it had heard of these things. It did know about them. And that was in the record that it knew about uh, the fact that these monitors could help avoid catastrophic outcomes like what happened to the plaintiff in this case. And therefore the, the court ruled or in its opinion said, a standard of due care necessarily embodies what a reasonably prudent hospital would do and hence care and foresight exceeding the minimum required by law or mandatory professional regulation may be necessary to meet that standard, okay? And uh, sort of drawing on that case, uh, Barry Furrow, a co-author of one of the leading health law textbooks, has stated that the ease of detection promised by data analytics points to a new standard of care for hospitals, enterprise responsibility for adverse events beyond the narrow culpability tests of ordinary tort cases. Okay, so I think this points toward an ongoing duty to um, take care of, of your whole community and not just sort of increase your outcomes or improve your outcomes in the aggregate, right? Um, however, we should also recognize that, you know, going to other famous cases like Hall versus Hilbon, a Mississippi case, very influential in the development of malpractice doctrine, that there are resource constraints, right? Uh, even if we have sort of a, a robust notion of the standard of care, uh, that courts do recognize resource constraints and try to develop this sort of delicate balance between encouraging inclusive medical innovation and recognizing limits on uh, technological advances. Now, in thinking about, you know, how do we balance those sorts of things, right? One of the things that I was led to, and I have to admit, this is somewhat fortuitous because um, I just happened to, to, to do a lot of work in the, you know, health data area, is that in some state tort cases for breach of privacy or confidentiality, failure to abide by federal HIPAA administrative and technical safeguards may lead to liability. And just to give a little background here um, with respect to HIPAA, HIPAA does not uh, give anyone a private right of action, right? If, you're, if you think that your healthcare provider has violated HIPAA, 
you can file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and they may impose fines or a corrective action plan in order to um, bring the provider back up to speed and to, and to make sure that they are um, and either to, to punish them for failing to abide by HIPAA or to, and, and moreover to make sure that they, they abide by it in the future. But you don't have a private right of action under the federal law. However, virtually every state has some kind of um, uh, confidential, either medical confidentiality law or other form of state of uh, privacy protection. And under HIPAA, those are not preempted. And so with respect to those um, uh, generally not preempted, um, there are some special cases, but generally not preempted um, because the HIPAA, HIPAA becomes a, a floor, not a ceiling of protection. And in that sense, you, the courts are often grasping for trying to find um, uh, what should be the standard of care in some relatively technical areas. You know, for example, like how secure should the passwords be on a hospital computer system? Um, what should be the administrative safeguards taken when, for example, one is trying to destroy paperwork and wants to make sure that one is actually contracting with an entity that is safe, uh, trustworthy in order to destroy that paperwork and won't you know, turn around and sell it to uh, somebody who is going to misuse it, those sorts of things. And you know, if you look at the, there's some really interesting cases that you know, cited in, the, in, in, in my piece for today, um, such as you know, the Bonnie versus Stevens Memorial Hospital, Fenian versus Rite Aid, Acosta versus Byram. Those were the cases that uh, stated that essentially um, you can, uh, HIPAA can inform the applicable standard of, care and st standard of care in common law tort cases, okay? So that's the idea there is that like, even though you don't have your uh, private right of action under HIPAA, you can uh, point to its standards to inform the standard of care when uh, state courts would decide your claim about uh, a breach of your privacy. Now, some courts, you know, I mean, there's, there's at least a couple of cases that say that it's negligence per se if the provider fails to abide by the HIPAA standard, right? And that goes pretty far, right? So, so you know, and, and that's certainly contestable and controversial and there are others that say, no, you know, don't go that far. And certainly if we were to talk about the sort of all the controversies over clinical practice guidelines in this area, um, you know, we, we know there are many sort of uh, potential, uh, uh, that's a potential minefield if we go all, all that way. But I think that at least with respect to informing the standard of care, it, these are very useful tools, these types of federal standards. And I think that similar regulatory evidence of a standard of care should inform cases involving AI. And in some of my work, uh, when I served on the, um, uh, as chair of the Privacy and Confidentiality and Security Subcommittee of the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, I was interested in trying to inform and educate members of that committee and members of HHS more generally about these opportunities and this, this need, because I think it is a, is a deep need now to get some of these sort of standards um, out there to inform potential future lawsuits in exactly these areas of uh, failures of database representativeness. So what could be some of the sources of guidance? So some could be federal regulatory requirements or guidance issued by HHS, OCR, NIST, FDA, other entities, and you know, there's some work I'm doing now on, on with respect to FDA and uh, software as a medical device, et cetera, that would be going in that direction. Um, there could be state regulatory requirements or guidance as states are getting increasingly interested in this type of, of work. And I, I hope that there will be some openings here, for example, with respect to uh, New York City's or, or New York State's regulation of hiring algorithms. For example, if you have hiring algorithms that are parsing a person's face or the way that they speak that do not include uh, in their data sets as positive examples, um, the mode of presentation of people in minority groups, I think that should be very suspect. And I think that that should be part of these types of regulations that could then inform lawsuits that would go in that direction. And then uh, potentially the Joint Commission. So the Joint Commission on Accreditation, um, this is an entity that is, again, one of the myriad entities that I, I talked about in my 2014 uh, North Carolina article about all the ways in which the, the, the federal government outsources sort of responsibility for technical uh, guidance to uh, these um, uh, Non, non-governmental organizations. It's one of them. And in this case called Tavares versus Evergreen Hospital System, the jury instructions ha, uh, had a standard of care based on a joint commission standard for um, hospital uh, staffing, right? And I think that just as there are, are um, standards with respect to staffing, there should be standards that are uh, put forward that are with respect to database representativeness and other aspects of databases um, fully including um, all members of society. 
right? Um, corporate negligence is another uh, tool that I sort of push forward in the article and uh, pointing to uh, Thompson v. Nason. Um, Sorry, I, I accidentally I cut out Thompson v. Nason in the slide, but this is that's the case that it's from, and uh, it certainly is cited enough times to, it, it, in the in the piece itself. And according to Professor Furrow, um, that's been adopted in 30 states. And a non-exclusive list of the duties that flow from the overall duty to ensure the patient's safety and well-being while at the hospital includes a duty to re use reasonable care in the maintenance of safe and adequate facilities and equipment. And I think that's something that also when we think about facilities and equipment. Uh, AI enhanced clinical decision support software and diagnostic software are going to be a bigger and bigger part of that. And that's where I think we need that help, that sort of complementarity between the tort and the regulatory system. Um, there are advanced infrastructures of health data collection and standards bodies. And I think bodies informed by like what the National Institute of Standards and Technology at Commerce or uh, entities at HHS do um, could really help here. I point to a couple of encouraging precedents, including um, the expert de-identification alternative in high tech, where there's been some ongoing efforts by uh, HHS to inform how that's done with respect to keeping uh, data sets safe or, or certifying the safety of data sets, and the um, uh, testing certification bodies for electronic health records that were part of the um, 2009 uh, Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act that was part of the AWRA back in 2009. And those are other entities that I think are, you know, that built, building into their standards for EHRs, for electronic health records, um, certain, uh, the, these types of concerns would be a good thing as well. So one thing about this paper is it's, it's not just about, I think, the AI of the future. It's also about being um, relatively sensitive to even the development and ongoing development of existing technology that may not have that sophisticated an AI component, but still needs to pay attention to health disparities. And that needs to be a bigger part of that conversation. Um, I think also that, you know, going back in, in going in the direction of other, other parts of law, right? I've talked a lot about health law here, but I think in thinking about how the ideas in this piece could apply to other areas of law, I think that health law is really interestingly exceptionalist in the sense that a lot of the doctrines, what I would call doctrines of irresponsibility in an in a article from a couple of years ago in the Maryland Law Review, a lot of these doctrines of irresponsibility like exculpatory clauses or uh, preemption um, or uh, um, First Amendment uh, uh, defenses, they are of less relevance in health law um, because I think many of the courts dealing with them think that there's, uh, it's exceptional because of the exceptional uh, uh, complexity and um, uh, stakes involved. And I think that as we see AI in, increasing, uh, in an increasing number of areas of uh, uh, business and of governmental administration, you're gonna see those, that type of exceptionalism grow and I think a growing imperative to hold entities responsible in, in the ways that I've described. Um, a recent application, for example, of this piece, um, I just got you know, one of those, those Google alerts that says, Hey, I mean, this is, you've been cited, and so I, I was very happy to see this. This little uh, citation was that saying uh, from a, a article that was published in the Berkeley Public Policy Journal um, just a week ago or so on the disparate impact of family surveillance and risk assessment technologies. And one of the things they point out is they state that the history of collecting data only on the most marginalized serves as the foundation for the strong correlations between poverty and child maltreatment. And so one concern here is, you know, here I think building on Michelle Gilman's work, um, some databases may be overrepresenting the vulnerable, others may be underrepresenting the vulnerable. And so when we look at this sort of general problem of, you know, the, perhaps the, the punishing, the punishment centric databases overrepresenting some groups and the um, assistive um, helping databases underrepresenting them, that becomes part of, I think, a broader societal project to make sure that we are, uh, you know, have this level of representativeness in databases. Um, just a couple of last points. One is just to sort of situate this paper in, in my past work, and then to sort of talk about a couple of ways where I'm, places where I'm, I'm trying to bring it uh, forward. In terms of my past work, I think that, you know, this fourth law of robotics article from Ohio State, where I was responding to Jack Balkin's uh, work on the algorithmic society, um, I believe that responsible AI development is a critical social aim. I think that it really it's, it's part of all of our tasks, I think whatever our substantive areas of law are, to look at how is AI being suggested either as, an, as a complement to or a substitute for 
uh, attorneys and policymakers in that area, and to make sure that we are holding it responsible and that we're trying to build exactly the same types of um, uh, strategies and institutions of responsibility that we have for the administrative state for the um, uh, AI tools that are increasingly either replacing or supplementing or informing those bureaucracies. Um, also, contemporary AI development is data intensive. And when you look at the overlapping legal regimes that govern data collection analysis and use, there are many opportunities for public values to increasingly inform those. Um, inaccurate and inappropriate data can have massive adverse impacts. And therefore, I think there really should be tort liability for many uses of inaccurate and inappropriate data. And that, to come to this piece, regulators can help us delineate the standard of care here. So to move forward, you know, some of my future projects in this vein, um, I'm working on ways to ensure there's more data um, created in the health sector to help us uh, understand and promote the welfare of the most mar marginalized groups. Um, that's part of this promoting data for well-being while minimizing stigma paper for a collection called Taming Digital Dominance. Um, I also want to be sure that, you know, when we as attorneys use data sets, that we're using ones that are representative. So one of the things that I think is so interesting in the second piece in categorizing use cases for black box AI administrative in administrative adjudications, I took as a jumping off point there, a Trump administration proposal to look at people's social media feeds and to use, potentially use that data uh, against them in, for example, uh, reapplications or renewals of disability benefits. You know, and one thing I really worry about there is like, it may be that there are some, that this systematically disadvantages people that like set their Instagram to public and have, you know, don't have, haven't set it to private. And, you know, what could the disparate impacts of that be? You know, maybe there are, maybe there's something different about uh, uh, the ways in which that affects different groups in society could have a disparate impact. And I think thinking about problems like that and potential sources of information that would be feeding into black box AI and administrative adjudications is very important. And then finally, there's just a more theoretical piece called explanation as a constitutive practice in law that I'm uh, doing for the Journal of Cross-Disciplinary Research and Computational Law, um, which is essentially looking forward at, at how uh, in, uh, the uh, European standards and requirements for explainability with respect to AI can help get us to a point where we better understand the data that's going into these systems. And with that better understanding, we can help address some of the uh, problems that uh, I've, I've tried to address uh, in a limited way uh, in this piece. So finally, you know, I think my bottom line would be, we've really got to try to preserve this tort regulation balance and the AI development is really exciting and to be applauded in these areas. I don't want to lose the, the lead because that really was the, the big message of my, my new laws of robotics book about AI and medicine, but it will only be fair and just if tort law is informed by standards of care, informed by expert regulation. Um, so with that, uh, thanks so much. And I, I really look forward to the questions and conversation afterward. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was a, a fabulous summary, uh, and I uh, appreciate the, the additional context, sort of setting the work in context. Uh, and we want to invite questions now through the uh, through the chat channel. Um, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my uh, uh, moderator's position and and uh, exercise my prerogative to to ask the first question. Um, so, uh, you know, the 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 thrust of the piece uh, to think about regulating AI uh, in terms of tort law and, and uh, uh, administrative oversight um, really requires us to think about data as, as a product, right? Uh, you know, you might have essentially defective data, data that's inappropriate, data that's incomplete, data that uh, uh, is uh, uh, not uh, uh, is faulty in some sense for the purposes it's gonna be used for. Um, and, and there's a fairly long line, as, as you know, of tort cases where courts tend to decline to think about information or data uh, as something that can be treated as a product, right? So, you know, uh, the uh, field guide to edible mushrooms has incorrect information in it, uh, but somebody follows that and eats a poisonous mushroom and dies. Uh, you know, there are quite a number of cases like that where uh, courts say, no, we're sorry, uh, information uh, is not a product that's governed by tort law in this way. Um, there, there are a couple of outlying cases uh, dealing with things like maps and charts, you know, where the where the, the aeronautical map is wrong, and so the pilot flies into the side of a mountain, uh, where a court has said, well, in that case, the map is maybe more like the, you know, kind of like a guidance system, so maybe it's not informational in the same sense. But, um, but since then, we, we, we now have the Supreme Court in cases like Sorrel, uh, you know, saying, well, uh, actually, we think that, you know, data and databases might be covered by 
uh, uh, a high level of scrutiny, right? They're, they don't say which level of scrutiny, but they say heightened scrutiny uh, for data under the First Amendment. So, you know, so you, you mentioned the First Amendment very briefly in the, in the presentation, but, but it seems to me that uh, particularly given what the court has said about that recently, um, isn't that going to be kind of a problem? I mean, I, I don't know if it's sc strict scrutiny or at least intermediate scrutiny, but you're going to get heightened scrutiny for any type of regulation of the sort you're talking about. Um, is that an impediment to your approach or is it going to be difficult to thread that needle uh, if we treat data, we need to treat data as a product, but the Supreme Court thinks that no, it's actually protected speech? It's, it's such a great question and wow, I, I, I want to go in a few different directions with it. So, you know, one is I completely agree with your concern, right? I mean, I think that in, in looking at, for example, Chris Robertson's uh, recent piece about the tip of the iceberg with respect to First Amendment deregulation of um, health law. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you look at like a lot of like a long line of FDA cases, um, sort of limiting what the FDA can do with respect to tobacco packaging or other things like that and um, limiting. Um, uh, and, and of course, Sorrell, absolutely, that is a very important shot across the bow. Um, and we're now seeing to get into this uh, sort of database context and regulation of databases when Clearview AI uh, points to Sorrell, you know, when, when the Illinois Biometrics Protection Act, I believe, is, is now being contested by Clearview AI, and I, I think maybe Floyd Abrams is representing them, I'm not certain, but, you know, it's a really serious First Amendment challenge where they're saying, essentially, um, uh, we believe that we have a First Amendment right to construct this database as we wish with this public information, um, and we challenge your ability to do this. And, of course, for a long time, um, privacy law and data protection law has been on something of a collision course with respect to um, the First Amendment, you know, ever since, you know, I think the Volokh article uh, characterizing privacy as the right to keep other people from talking about you, you know, and, and, and Jane uh, Bambauer's work on uh, data as speech uh, in the Stanford Law Review. So two responses where, two places where I think I would, I would try to build up um, a, a defense here, of, or, or at least uh, to try to deflect the First Amendment defense, one would be um, to look at Claudia Haupt's work on professional speech. Um, she's done, I think, now a series of like four or five articles talking about the ways in which um, regulation in a profession, um, uh, that, that a profession can regulate what people say, because we can't take it so far, right? We can't have a world where doctors can tell you, um, they can just tell you whatever they think, and then you end up with, uh, they say, well, yeah, your cough doesn't sound too bad, and then turns out to be lung cancer. And then they say, well, that was my opinion. I mean, my opinion was that you had, you know, so you're making me responsible for my opinion. It was just speech, right? And so I think that what help does, I think, in a very smart way is tries to, you know, draw out what does it mean for a profession to be able to hold its members responsible and to keep them from asserting um, free expression claims in that way. Um, I also think that Neil Richards sort of responses to Bambauer's work and others uh, with respect, sort of saying a lot, most of privacy law is not going to be held unconstitutional under the First Amendment um, because uh, uh, essentially one idea there was that if you you could limit Sorrell by saying that the big problem with the Vermont um, uh, legislation in that case was that it was directed at the um, trying to shape the communicative playing field, whereas most, you know, it was trying to sort of really limit what pharmaceutical companies were able to say in order to promote a strategy of, of anti-detailing or counter-detailing that, you know, the Harvard Med School professor Jerry Avorn was promoting then to say, if we could just keep those pharma companies from having, from targeting their messages so well, we could, you know, keep them from reaching people. Whereas like this stuff, you know, seems to be for, it's, it's not about the communicative environment, I, mean, I think it's more about uh, uh, other social goals, um, including non-discrimination. And in some ways it's about improving the communicative environment, although um, we can, we can, I know that will be contested as well. Um, and, and I think that the, um, in other, you know, the First Amendment type of claims, oh, Clearview AI, what was so interesting with, with respect to Clearview AI, and I know this doesn't hold water in America, but just, just yesterday, I think, or the day before, the Canadian Privacy Commissioner uh, set down a ruling on Clearview AI, and Clearview AI had said, hey, look, Canada has free expression laws, and we think that what we're doing should be protected. And essentially what the commissioner said, and I know that this is not, you know, and I haven't read it in great detail, but I just at least wanted to have the citation was that it, they said, Clearview AI has really hasn't rooted its theory of, of um, uh, excuse me, <coughs> um, uh, promoting free expression via um, a facial recognition database 
in any uh, convincing theory of human flourishing or of uh, a normative communicative theory. And I think that's true. I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of root, it, root that in um, a broader theory. Now, of course, I'm sure that, you know, I, I, if I were to read all the briefs in the um, Illinois case now, I'd, I'd find some of those. But I, but I think that learning from some of these other jurisdictions that are not taking those uh, free expression claims so seriously um, would be important here. So I think between all of those, I mean, another example, I guess, that I would give is that I think that some of this, uh, these databases, I would try to characterize as more of an operational as opposed to a natural language. So, and, and I know that, that that distinction, at least trying to build a, a beachhead for it in the doctrine is difficult. I can look to Tim Wu's uh, article on machine speech and try to build that, you know, in terms of his efforts. But I realize that, you know, you're right to say that, like, at least in American jurisprudence, the more popular view is probably that of Stuart Benjamin on, in his article, Algorithms and Speech, which is, which is much more protective of, of algorithms and algorithmic processes from a free speech perspective. So my bottom line here would be that um, my hope is that um, this will uh, be framed as part of the privacy law that uh, Justice Kennedy himself in Sorrell said he did not want to disturb. I think he, he does have a line in Sorrell. Of course, it might be over dicta, but I think there's a line in Sorrell that says, we're not trying to get rid of HIPAA here, folks. Um, and then I also think that we could, we could root it that in that part of what, what the HHS is doing with respect to regulation of data. And then I think that, uh, or, uh, and then I think that the professional uh, exception would be the second place where I, I would go to. I'm going to, I'm going to permit myself a, a slight follow-up. So, so is your, is your sense that this might be uh, sort of sector or industry specific, right? You, you said in your presentation that uh, you felt that first amendment defenses and other kinds of uh, defenses might be less important in the health law context. Uh, but if we get to something else, you know, to uh, autonomous vehicles or something uh, that maybe there'll be different treatment. That's a great question. I mean, I think that yes, I think that that's I think that's right. I mean, I, I mean, one, it's funny, because I, I wanted to use this piece to argue that everything should become like health law, right? <laughs> and the same that the same types of, you know, caution we have about exculpatory clauses, you know, it's very, it's, it's very, very, if, if it's, your doctor gives you a piece of paper that says, hey, just sign this and just promise you'll never sue me for malpractice. Courts are much more skeptical of that than of, of you know, most other exculpatory clauses, right? And so part of what I'm trying to do with this piece is to say that, like, I think that, the, and the reason why they are is because they, uh, of course, in the leading case, leading California case on this Tunkel versus Regions of California, they give six reasons for why they're skeptical about exculpatory clauses in the medical context. And, you know, uh, and I think one of them really, at least a few of them apply in the, in the AI context as well, which is the sort of information asymmetries, hard to make sense of the thing. The doctor has a lot more power than you do, et cetera. And I think that certainly uh, to me rings true of our relationships with a lot of the companies that do AI and, uh, and, and these predictive analytics software, um, this, the, the sort of power asymmetries and the rest. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if I had to, um, say that, well, it's just about how, if, if I had to argue it as being a healthcare matter and just focusing on healthcare databases, I would say that, yeah, I would, I would try to use that healthcare exceptionalism just within the database context and say, hey, just as we really rely on our doctors, these are the things that our doctors are relying on. And we need to have some safeguards and responsibility for the people that are making them. So. Okay, we've got a question from the uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, Maybe able to see in the chat there. there there's a, an increasing legislative push uh, for algorithmic accountability and indicates a, a bill in the California legislature, AB 13 is an example, uh, where uh, developers would need to report the types of data that they use, uh, the uses of their automated decision systems and more. Uh, how do you see this impacting the development of data regulation and tort law? It's kinds of, uh, 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 if we have, have requirements for uh, essentially uh, data or algorithmic accountability reports. Yeah, I think it's very exciting. And I think that it really, it really is, uh, makes me very happy to see that because, I mean, it's, it's funny in, in thinking about, you know, the past 10 years of algorithmic accountability as a movement. Um, when I was writing Black Box Society, like in the early 2010s, transparency was all the rage. And certainly it was a big message of my book, of that book. But, you know, it's more recently, like there are critiques saying, oh, transparency is just this, you know, accountability theater, it doesn't really matter much, you know, it's just uh, mindless paperwork, et cetera, and people can't make sense of it. You know, and, and there's certainly a larger uh, critique of disclosure in the legal literature by I think only Ben Shahar and, and uh, Carl Schneider and others in, in that vein. 
But I think that overstates, overshoots the mark. I think that actually a lot of these efforts on the state and federal level to require disclosure of basic things like what data are you using, how are you using the data, et cetera, is really helpful. Because for example, we might wonder, you know, or we might say, and I think I give the example in the book of, or in the article of like a database from 2025 or a, a database used in 2020 for, for example, voice recognition that may be like the genome-wide association study uh, 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 participants that I mentioned in the talk, 96% those of European descent or however you wanna classify an unrepresentative group, right? And it may turn out that by say 2025, there are data sets available that are far more representative. And I think that part of, for example, discrimination claim, a tort claim, other forms of claims should be uh, the ability to look at what was the underlying data fed into the machine learning or AI system and to check whether the people involved were actually trying to um, accommodate and to um, anticipate uh, uh, this problem, the problem of non-representativeness. Because I think at this point, it's just such a common problem, right? And, and I mean, I give the example in the, in the Ohio State piece that came you know, the year before this one of um, Microsoft unleashed the, the chatbot Tay online. And you know, this was, they said, oh, well, you know, let's see what happens. It's gonna interact with people. And you know, within like, I think two days, it was uh, you know, emitting, I don't wanna say saying, cause I don't wanna too um, anthropomor anthropomorphize it, um, but it was sort of emitting, you know, just really offensive, terrible language. And I think that you know, at some point, if someone were to do that, do that experiment nowadays and just say, oh, let's see what our chatbot does, um, we have to be able to say, and I think even in the case when Microsoft did it, I think we could have said that you understand um, the nature of the data that it's going to encounter and you'd better build in some safeguards to make sure that, uh, to help ensure that it doesn't um, do what is I think reasonably foreseeable from the sort of uh, type of data set or type of uh, environment that it's being put into. So overall, I'm really happy to see this type of legislation going forward. I think lots of states are going to do it. Um, accountability, like the transparency is just a first step, but it will, I think, helpfully be a very helpful um, handhold or sort of a, a hook on which to hang um, larger concerns and say potential lawsuits um, for uh, tort, uh, in tort or in other, other areas. Yeah, so, so uh, looking back to your example that you, that you gave us of the, uh, of the case with the oxygen monitor, for example, um, you know, this, this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a classic, uh, you know, learned hand TJ Hooper, uh, you know, why don't you have a radio on your tugboat uh, type of question, um, you know, whether, uh, whether you want uh, tort law and regulation to be uh, technology forcing to kind of, you know, push the industry out to the edge of what's possible, um, or whether you set the standard of care as to, you know, what the uh, industry sort of adopts or agrees at the time is the, uh, is the, is the proper um, uh, technology to adopt, right? Um, and, and those are, those are very, very different approaches. I mean, you, you seem to, you seem to uh, be oriented towards the technology forcing approach, um, but then somebody has to figure out, you know, and, and it's not the industry, but somebody has to figure out sort of, you know, what, what is the uh, highest level of care or what is the uh, leading technology that needs to be adopted. Um, and so where do you see that decision being made? If it's not sort of organic uh, by, by looking at, okay, wh what is the current practice? That's the standard of care. We want you to go beyond that. Um, who has the expertise to decide uh, what's, what's the leading edge or the bleeding edge here that uh, uh, the industry should be adopting? Great. So I'll go in two directions with that. I mean, a couple from transport, uh, from the transport examples, and then, and then one from the FTC. Maybe I should start with the FTC. I mean, I think that when the Federal Trade Commission has been trying to develop over the years um, security standards and sort of trying to decide what level of security is not unfair to your users. So for example, in the Wyndham case, I think that the, in Wyndham, there was a hotel chain that had all this data from its, uh, those who had clients to the hotel, um, credit cards, important personal, personal identifiable data. And I think that the person who cracked it um, tried over a hundred times, like tried pass, like over a hundred passwords then finally forced their way into the system. And the FTC sued and said, you know, wait a second, you know, this is, this seems, unfair, this is unfair to us. Like we should have at least had the most basic safeguard, which would be to say, have a lockout or a timeout when someone tries five or 10 times to put in their password. 
Right. I think on the iPhone, it's like 10 times and watch out, it's like locked or something. You got to bring it into the genius bar or something. And so I think that that is, uh, and that's just for your own iPhone, you know. And so that I think is helpful, you know, sort of developing ideas like that and saying that we're going to, and then that in turn, courts being able to look to that and saying, um, wow, it's hard. It's very difficult for the Federal Trade Commission to set something like that, a standard like that. If you look, for example, at, you know, all the litigation about Wyndham, and then also the uh, uh, commentary by people like Dan Solov and, and Woody Hartzog in uh, their, their pieces on the development of security standards by the FTC, it's, it's hard for them to do it. And so I think that could become in turn something of a minimum standard. You know, and, and, and I think that the guidance is put out by the agency. I'd like to see states pointing to those and saying, yeah, we're going to allow whatever might be the state level type of lawsuits uh, on the basis of failures to abide by those types of standards. With respect to AI and sort of the AI standards that I talked about in this piece, say with the relevant databases, or even with respect to, let me start with the help. Oh yeah, but I wanted to go back to, to transport, right? So yeah. with transport, I mean, I thought that with respect to the, an example I sometimes give with this talk to make it more visceral and uh, directly uh, in people's direct experience, I sometimes use the, the example of the, bull, the 737 MAX where, um, I believe yeah. that the 737 MAX had one sensor as a default, but you could buy additional sensors for $80,000. And that if you had three sensors, it would be far more less likely that one sensor would go haywire and thereby mess up the uh, crash avoidance system, which in turn caused the failures of the, uh, of the, of the plane. Um, that led to the two, two, two planes going down, I think from Indonesia and, and Ethiopia, right? And so one question there is, you know, do you have a federal aviation administration that will set standards and that says things like, hey, you should have two to three sensors on this, um, like is, the, is done, I believe by the rival manufacturer. I think Airbus actually does do that, but in part because they have more automated flying than, than Boeing does. But you, you, they might say something like that, that should be the standard or that would be the regulatory standard. And then you would sort of uh, uh, work from there um, or a recommendation, it could be a recommendation or something along those lines. So I think that would be maybe a source of expertise. Um, I also in future work, I wanna look at the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration's uh, uh, jurisprudence about it, like in the Geyer case, and then there's a case called Sprietzma, which are about sort of looking at the interaction between the federal standards and whether those preempt state law. Because the big worry I had in this piece was um, federal regulation preempting tort law. I don't want that to happen, right? I want it to be used as a way of informing the state tort law um, and not preempting it. But my hope is that we can invest in these entities and particularly have like the Affordable Care Act has it, it established six offices of minority health that were established in different parts of the Department of Health and Human Services. And I think that those sorts of uh, 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 an ombudsperson or someone with uh, expertise in the development of representative databases should play a role in helping develop the technical administrative standards for these databases in different entities in, in the government. Yeah. So a uh, final question from the audience and then we, uh, we need to let you go. A um, uh, question is, uh, do you have thoughts about how this might apply in the pharmaceutical sector? Uh, obviously, lots of applications of, of AI and pharmaceutical development, whether that's identifying new targets or uh, sifting through data to find uh, you know, new, uh, new uses of, of known drugs. Um, uh, if you have uh, required representative data sets and, and anal analytic accountability, um, uh, do you have thoughts about uh, uh, how, your, uh, how your work might apply there in pharmaceuticals? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question in thinking about pharmaceuticals. And I mean, also FDA has a role in um, software regulation as well, you know, under the 21st Century Cures Act and other things. And, and you know, it's a, so it's, it's, gonna, it's a growing area for the FDA. And I think that there, there's gonna be some really interesting um, tensions in terms of how the FDA decides either to, uh, how the FDA regulates and decides not to regulate and where it exercises forbearance. So for example, um, I believe under uh, 21st century cures, FDA is excluded. They can't regulate explainable software that makes recommendations to healthcare professionals, but they can regulate um, software that acquires processes or analyze signals from diagnostic devices and non-explainable software that makes recommendation to healthcare professionals. 
And so this area is actually, I think, a really interesting area in terms of like a potential um, beachhead for further development of expertise and sort of a position at FDA on these types of issues and you know how they were going to regulate. Because I think that you know with respect to that, uh, uh, being able to regulate these non-explainable software, in a way, that is sort of analogizing the software to products and to, to things, as you mentioned in your first question, Dan, right? You know, that the non-explainable is like a product and we want to have, and we want to leave open something like product liability for it, um, uh, it on precisely those grounds. And so I actually am working now on a project uh, with um, Barbara Evans of U Florida on, on this issue and happy to send that, that draft uh, your way to wh whomever asked the question because I, uh, it might be of interest and uh, it, I'd love your comments on it. So thank you. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to point out again, for those who need MCLE credit, that there is a link uh, down in the in the chat for you to uh, get the forms for that. Uh, a special thanks to the staff here at UCI, who's uh, UCI Law, who's helped uh, make this possible. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, you will all join us uh, again on March 8th uh, for a presentation by Professor Rebecca Krutoff on autonomous uh, weapons. Uh, but for right now, let's give a round of virtual applause to uh, Professor Pascal for being here with us. Thanks, Frank. Oh, thank you, Dan. Great. Great to see you.